<laughs> yeah, um, yeah, so I'm, my name is Frank Kalicek. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Nextcloud. Um, this uh, might be a little bit of a duplication from the talk that Brent did earlier, but I will focus uh, more on the AI side, what we are doing here, which is uh, really open and open source AI, not like <laughs> open AI. <laughs> uh, yeah, a few months ago, I, um, I, I, I tried to register closedai.com as a joke. Um, it, it, it was available at the time, now it's no longer available, but yeah, <laughs> anyway. Um, so um, when I started this journey here with Nextcloud and the project before, uh, the motivation was um, to have a true open source and local alternative to these guys here. Um, mostly, obviously, Microsoft 365 and Google Workspace like a tool that you can use to communicate and collaborate over the internet, but um, something that is not SaaS, but real open source software that you can run and deploy wherever you want. So to keep your data and the application <coughs> and everything under control. That's obviously the, the motivation uh, behind it. Um, this is why we have uh, um, a structure like that. It's a bit of a simplification, um, but you can see that there is Nextcloud files, that for files you can share. That's still the core of everything. Then we have talk for chat video conferencing, group fair for mail, <coughs> calendar contacts, and office for editing of office documents. So everything is a bit uh, is under the umbrella of Nextcloud Hub. So Nextcloud Hub is basically the, the umbrella name for all these components. That's of course a simplification because some of you might know that we have this app store that um, Brent mentioned earlier with like hundreds of other components that you can install as you want. But these are basically the main ones. And the reason is also because this is what sort of expected from a Microsoft and Google alternative, because as you know, they have the same, right? They have like OneDrive, Google Drive for files. They have like um, Teams for chatting video conferencing, Outlook and so on. So it's basically an equivalent to that. Again, as I said, the main difference is that this is all open source and on-premise. I sometimes make the joke that I picked the wrong name because Nextcloud is actually not cloud <laughs> at all. It's software that you can use um, to put on some infrastructure and then you have your cloud, it's basically your service. But we as Nextcloud are not a cloud company, we are a software company. So we deliver, uh, deliver, uh, deliver the software. There was a question earlier where we host our AI models. The answer is we don't host it at all. Again, can be downloaded and you can host it wherever you want and there are different options for that. Um, let's go a little bit through the different products here. But I think earlier it was uh, Brent asked in the room who knows Nextcloud, so most of you know Nextcloud already, so I'll make this very quick. Um, this is the files part. You can upload <coughs> and download and share and tag and search, do everything with your files. It's like a file manager, basically. Um, this is only the web interface. As you know, there's also a desktop client for Mac, Windows, Linux, and there's also an application for iOS and Android to all, again, work with your files, everything open source and for free, obviously. Next, lot talk for chatting and video conferencing. It's really similar to Teams or Slack, similar solutions with all the usual features you expect. Also, um, for video calling, again, I think this is one of the very few full-fledged video conferencing and chat application that can really run completely on, on premise and is really comparable with Teams and other solutions. Then there is, of course, the groupware part. This is the calendar that we have. There's a, um, a web mailer uh, with all the powerful features with encryption, priority inbox, and so on, everything you expect. And there is um, Nextcloud Office, which is based on LibreOffice to edit, like, complicated office documents collaboratively with different <coughs> persons at the same time together with other people. So this is um, basically um, what we do and this was the status of like one and a half years ago and um, I thought we are in a really good position here to be like the open source alternative to Microsoft and Google um, and then came the AI revolution. And uh, I got a little bit of a depression because I thought, oh no, first of all, can we even compete anymore? Can we as <coughs> nice open source community compete with these huge companies, um, with these gigantic hosting centers, the Azure Cloud, with like 
millions of GPUs and all this machine learning and gigantic data sets. Is there something we can even compete with this nice small open source community? And the second reason for my depression was, do we even want to compete? Uh, because AI raises a lot of questions, ethical questions. Do we even want to do that? Um, is it the right path? Or should like open source just ignore it, do something different? Um, and that's a really uh, difficult decision because obviously it has the opportunity, AI has the opportunity to make our lives easier and better to automate boring things. Right? And we all want to get rid of boring things, that's obvious. Um, but of course there's also a bit of the dark side um, of AI. Um, it comes with a lot of ethical questions and some things that we need to really think about how this fits the open source values that we all like. And uh, I think we are not the only ones here with some questions around the ethical side of AI. A lot of companies, they actually ban the use of ChatGPT. So companies like Samsung or Apple or Goldman Sachs and many others actually forbid the use of ChatGPT in the company. So they also have some questions. So why is that? First of all, there's a lot of fear from misinformation. And I think in the press we saw reports where some companies and lawyers and other people used ChatGPT to prepare some text and then later it became clear that it was all bullshit. Right? So <laughs> that's of course a, pro a problem. Second is, um, what does it mean for our privacy and security? Because we know that uh, OpenAI and Google and all the others, they use the data we feed into the system as training data for the model. So it's absolutely possible that someone is using ChatGPT to work with some confidential documents, and then this goes into the training data, and later the competitor is using ChatGPT and becomes answers that are based on the confidential documents of the, of the competition. So this is just a whole <laughs> new level of privacy problems that we have here. So this actually brought us really to this problem one and a half years ago where we thought, okay, what, what do we do? So we tried to tackle both problems. First of all, the ethical side, where we really looked into what this means and how this all fits the open source and privacy values that we have, and can we actually do it? So it actually, uh, in the next cloud, we created a new team, the AI team, that really works with these open source models and see what we can do there. And in parallel, we really looked into this ethical AI question, is how does this fit the mission that I had from the very beginning with Nextcloud? Of course, ethical is a big question, right? What does this even mean, ethical AI? Well, if you look through the, uh, the press and all the reports around AI, um, it was, it's relatively easy to identify some of the critical things. The first question here is discrimination, right? As we all know, these models are trained on data from the internet. And the internet is a, well, a reflection of our world. And our world is obviously full with discrimination. So no surprise, the models are also full with discrimination, right? So if you ask like some model to generate a photo of a doctor, you probably get a white man, right? So this is just because that's how it is on the internet, and this is how it is in our world, which is not how it should be. Right? So this is a big problem here. Um, the second is, what does it mean from a CO2 footprint perspective? Right? We have all these gigantic data centers from these big companies that are doing something with millions of GPUs. No one really knows how much energy they consume and what this really means from the CO2 footprint perspective and uh, from a climate change perspective. Of course, these companies are not transparent about their energy consumption because for them this is just a tactical, uh, strategic thing to um, increase the, um, the login into their systems like Microsoft and, and uh, Google, of course, and they're not really disclose what energy consumption is like um, uh, behind it. The second is the privacy question. Um, as I said earlier, it's not really clear what happens with the data and if they land up in some training sets or something. So, I don't know, if I want to work with my private data here, maybe I'm not comfortable that some model is trained based on my emails or some of my chat conversations, right? That's maybe a problem. And then the last point is, of course, is this even, this AI technologies, is this even freely available? 
right? I mean, we already see that the most powerful models are only behind the um, subscriptions from these big companies, right? You need to pay to get access to GBT4, for example, and other models, which, I don't know, I guess most in this room can afford it. But if you're living in the global south or somewhere else, well, then you're just cut off from the latest technologies, right? Well, a big part of open source means is actually to make technology available to everybody, which is uh, a problem here because that's not the case at the moment with the latest AI <coughs> systems. And this, uh, as Brent showed you earlier, um, brought us um, to the conclusion that we need a framework to put like other AI <coughs> systems that exist and also the stuff we are doing into the right perspective. Um, and what we did is we created this um, traffic light system from uh, green that we consider good and red not so good. And the uh, requirements for that were three things. First requirement is that the source code should be open source. And with source code, I mean um, this, um, the software that's needed to create these models um, and then also the software that's needed to interfere with these models to use them. And why is that? Because if the source code is open source, you can run it locally and you can check what's going on. You can actually measure the energy consumption and you can um, improve it over time. And you can just say, okay, the latest PyTorch has, is more optimized and uses 20% less resources, for example. We can actually measure that and we can actually optimize for that, which is not possible <laughs> if something is just a SaaS service on the internet, like uh, OpenAI. Second requirement is that the model should be available because if the model is available, I can run it locally and I can make sure that I interfere with the model locally, that no data is leaking anywhere else and my data is not used for training of something else because it's completely local, I can control it. And the last requirement is that the training data should be available because then you can actually look inside the training data and can make sure that there's no discrimination in there. And if there is, we can fix it and improve it. It's, for me, the training data is a little bit like the source code of a model, similar like the source code of a binary. So if you only have the binary and can run it, great, but you don't really know what's going on. And you really need to know what's going on to have the training data available. And if all three um, requirements are checked, then we give the green traffic light. If none of it is checked, it's the red one. And we have this classification for all the AI systems where we have integration with and also the, for the ones that we developed ourselves. And if you activate the different features in Nextcloud, you see the traffic light symbol and you can choose what to use. Maybe you choose to have the integration with ChatGPT. Sure, just one click and it works, but you need to know that this is a, a red service and don't really know um, well, what happens with the data, you don't even know the CO2 footprint, discrimination is a problem and so on. But there might be alternatives that are green where we have more control and really know more what's going on. So what we are doing at Nextcloud is to give you a choice. Once we have, we have activated these different apps, these different plugins, then in the admin interface, you can then choose what to use. For example, here is the translation system because we have a a translation system for text built into Nextcloud. And there you can use, uh, can decide if you want to use like the ChatGPT API, or you want to use this, this Opus model from the University of Helsinki, which is runs completely local and is completely open source with an open source training set. Right? And you can then configure what you use and you can decide um, how it fits your requirements. Right? The second one runs completely local on your machine. Obviously you need some resources for that but then you have it under control, or you just use a, a web service and you don't know what's going on, but you don't need any resources. Maybe you need to pay some subscription to them, but then it's completely out of your control. And this is the same for all other things. For example, if you want to use the speech-to-text features we have, exactly the same. You can run the official Whisper service from uh, OpenAI, or you can run something that runs completely local where no data is leaking anywhere else. And these are just examples for all the different features. You can really next load configure how you want to use that. Um, as I said, we have integrations with all these services like ChatGPT, but obviously our focus is to work on open source models that run completely local. This is where the, 
the AI team at Nextcloud is working on together with the community. Um, and this is the focus of obviously, because I think this is the ethical way and really fits the mission and vision of Nextcloud in the best way. <coughs> okay, now the question is, of course, what do we actually do with AI? Um, it's a bit of a hype, obviously, <laughs> but um, in, a, in a lot of areas, I think it's a bit overhyped, obviously, but in the case of uh, productivity software like Nextcloud, I think it's quite obvious where AI features are useful. I will show you some of them in a, in a second. So um, these are the bit more basic features we have for a while. For example, there is um, face recognition and object recognition in photos. So if you use Nextcloud to manage your vacation photos, you can detect, I know, cat, dog, bicycle in the photos. You can search for it and find all the right photos. And it can also group people with the face recognition um, together, so you can just very easily browse through your friends and families. And it's a uh, very nice, nice feature, it exists for quite some time. Then we have it in other areas like related resources, where we're grouping things together. Um, there is a um, suspicious login detection, where you can de detect um, weird login behaviors, and many, many other things. But I think it gets really interesting when we look into the latest features that we did. And this is around the next level assistant. Next level assistant is something you can imagine, something like the co-pilot for Microsoft. So these are the more advanced um, features in the AI section um, that we have here. We launched the uh, next level assistant last year in the version one. And just a few weeks ago, we reached the version 2.0 with a lot of um, additional improvements I will show you in a second. So this is using a large language model, which is 100% open source, and is running uh, completely self-hosted, if you want to. I will talk about uh, the self-hosting um, in a bit, because there are actually different choices. You can actually, if you want to, outsource it to other organizations. So this is all using a new API, which makes it possible to run like the models on different machines as a microservice. Um, I even heard like the colleagues from Tailscale mentioned um, that you can even use this um, to with, together with Tailscale to access like a powerful uh, GPU uh, cluster which is running somewhere else. This works like that because the communication goes over the, as, a, yeah, as a REST interface over the internet. So this is quite um, a flexible uh, solution. So what can it do? Well, first of all, it can do the basic things. You can chat with it, um, as you can imagine. You can just ask a question, um, hey, what is uh, important to organize something, you get a result, just as you imagine, just as it works with uh, ChatGPT. And you can do other things here, of course, too, but I think it becomes really powerful if you look into the integrations into the software itself. Because chat interface, I don't know, I find chat interface interesting, but it's not so useful. I think it's really useful when you integrate it into the different um, yeah, applications of Nextcloud itself. For example, let's look into it in text. Text is, of course, this markdown editor that we have, collaborative markdown editor in Nextcloud, and you, it works like that. You can, should be a video, yeah. You can click on a markdown file. <laughs> Here's the file, maybe you, um, uh, mark, uh, you, you select the file, then the assistant pops up, where you say, okay, I want to create a headline of this text, and it just generates a headline, and you can copy it, and you just put it in on the top of it um, as a headline, and then you have a headline generated. And the same, I don't know if you saw it, works for summarizing the text or translating the text in different languages, make it longer, change the style, and so on. So you don't really have to copy paste like in ChatGPT and back. It's, it works basically directly into your in your editor, which I think is a very nice, powerful feature. Um, in Nextcloud Mail, I think it's even a bit more um, visible, where we have um, on the left side, uh, we have our priority inbox. So it can actually work with a locally running machine learning model to analyze your mails and the behavior that you have with the mail. So it can recommend important mails to you, as you might know from Google and other services. But in this case, of course, the data stays on your machine. And then it has other features where you can summarize an email thread I don't know about you, but I get too many emails. I um, don't have time to read them anymore. So it has a nice feature to get a summary of a, a long email thread. Um, and of course, you can also use it to write emails. 
directly in the editor. We can say, hey, just generate a mail about some event, and it generates an example. Obviously, you should proofread it, not just send it. Um, but uh, that's something that's obviously super, super handy. Now, in the latest version, and the um, Assistant 2.0, it can also um, recommend replies to emails. Right? If you say want to reply to an email, and you can look through the text and also look into other replies that it did before, so you can recommend an, an, a reply to an email, which obviously is also um, super, super handy. Then let's look into Nextcloud Talk, which is, of course, the chat and video um, conferencing um, application that we saw earlier from Brand. One feature is the integration of the translation feature. So Nextcloud, we are an international organization with people speaking lots of different languages. So it's just super useful to have a translation feature directly um, in the chat, where you can say, hey, um, don't understand this message, please translate in my language, and you get an answer uh, super nicely and quickly. Then obviously we can do image uh, creation, so every good presentation needs a cat photo, so here's the cat photo, of course. So you can just generate some nice cat pictures and post it directly into the chat. Maybe not cat pictures, maybe you want to like, do some visualization of a project you're working on, but it's super useful just type in a prompt, get a photo, select a photo, and post it into the chat as a, um, something to, to discuss with your, with your colleagues. That's very useful. Um, then we have the feature that you can, in your chat conversations, also directly chat with the assistant. Let's say you have a team chat with your, and you talk about, I don't know, some event like this here. And then there's a question in the middle of the discussion. And you can at any time say, add assistant, what are the most important things to organize an event? And the assistant, like a real human assistant, gives you the answer, posts it into the chat, visible to everybody. And this can be just very useful as a, as a source um, for yeah, your discussions. Um, then uh, we have, um, as Brent already, so sorry for the application, <laughs> already showed you, we have this uh, Samurai bot. Well, developer thought it's a funny name. Uh, sorry for that. <laughs> it summarizes uh, chat conversations. And at any time you can say, hey, I don't have the time to read all the million things that your colleagues posted over the weekend. Give me a summary, and it summarizes it and gives you the, the topics directly into the chat <coughs> as, a, as a nice summary. Super useful. Then uh, we have our dictation feature. So some people prefer to dictate like documents, emails, chat messages. Um, I don't, but a lot of people like that. <laughs> so you can dictate something directly into Nextcloud and generate a chat message or whatever you want to send. Obviously, this dictation feature is also useful for other things. So um, Nextcloud can create a call recording for every video call you're doing. So sometimes you want to record a call and you want to then, um, I don't know, share it with your colleagues so you can look at the call later, but <coughs> maybe they don't have the time to look at the full video recording, then um, Nextcloud can create a full transcript of the video call and also later summarize it down if you want to. So that's something that is like, yeah, super useful. So these are the, I think, obvious integration features. And to be honest, they also exist with Microsoft and Google and other solutions. I think they're quite um, straightforward, but useful. But we also want to do something a bit more innovative, um, which I don't think exists a lot in other places. Um, the first is the feature of context chat. So what I showed you so far is you just interact with a model that was trained already before somewhere else. Right? Maybe we use Llama or the Mistral model or the Falcon model or some of the other open source ones. And they contain some information. You can ask, hey, how do you organize an event? And you give an, get, get an answer. But of course, the assistant don't really has any idea how I usually organize an event or doesn't really know how I work with my emails. Um, and here we wanted to create an assistant which knows my data. So I have an assistant we, which is not pre-trained based on some data from years ago that was found on the internet, but really something that knows my personal data. So this is what context chat is. Um, it works in a way that it creates an, you can imagine it like an index of all my files, all my chat messages, all my 
um, emails or my calendar invites and so on, everything in my next cloud. It stores this into a vector database. Vector database is this new type of databases which creates this multi-dimensional index of different tokens in relations to each other. And this is connected to the assistant with a cool tool called LangChain. And it basically makes it possible to chat with the assistant in a way that it knows my data. And again, the data stays on your server. It doesn't leave your infrastructure, not like other systems, completely local. And you can then say, hey, um, can you summarize in, in the, the information request from Ross over the last week or something? And then the system can go through all my emails and give you an answer based on that, um, which I think is like just super, super helpful. Um, the drawback of, of that system is that it takes quite some resources. So in our experiment, it basically takes like a second Nextcloud server, basically. Let's say you have one Nextcloud server that handles the data of your thousand users or whatever you have. And to have this, um, this vector database with the large language model basically need the same server again just to handle the assistant. So it's quite some resources, but it is obviously super, super useful. And it can also be used in other cases. For example, here is this Nextcloud deck which is the Kanban board, we can ask, hey, um, how do I usually organize an event? And it can go through all the different tickets and give you a summary how I usually organize an event. And that's something that's quite unique and useful, I think. Um, this exists, as far as I know, only in, in one other place, which is a feature for Microsoft. It's called Business Chat. It's very similar to that. Obviously, this is a SaaS solution, closed source. As I mentioned, you don't really know what's going on behind the, the, uh, the, the black box there. While, uh, of course, this is something completely open source running on your machine. The second feature is um, what I want to show you is something that we call context write. This can also generate documents, again, based on your own data. So you can say, hey, I have this PDF or I have this whatever document that describes something. And um, can I please create another document based on this document before, but with the following changes. So it can basically generate context, but takes your documents as input. Again, this is super useful, um, where you can, I don't know if you have an example here, um, where you can say, hey, um, create another PDF just with up-to-date information. So, this is basically where we are at the moment. So to summarize, my depression is gone now, which is good. <laughs> because first of all, I think as an open source community, we can compete with these companies. So we, we actually can compete. And this is a learning that is not only by me, but a big part of the open source community that is locally running relatively small models, which are freely available is actually, they're actually as good as these huge models running in the gigantic Azure uh, data centers. Um, so open source community can compete. And if you go to places like Hugging Face, for example, you can see a ton of activities with training sets, with models, with software tools. And I'm happy that the open source community actually is not out of the game, but we can actually compete with these big companies. And the second thing is, we can actually, if we apply some ethical rules to it, we can also decide what fits the open source story and what doesn't fit it. So we can, if we make this transparent and give our users the choice, we actually are able to have like, um, yeah, ethical AI systems. And um, yeah, this is the direction we are going. Um, I think AI can be useful if you do it right. And this is what we are trying to do at Nextcloud. So, I think now I'm done and have time for some questions. Oh, wow. Right. You, you mentioned that you, um, is it, um, for the assistant, you probably need a second server for it. Mm -hmm. Is it going to require much higher hardware specs, like a GPU or something? And if so, what would you suggest? So it doesn't need a GPU. It's, uh, it's abstracted, so it also runs on a, on a, on a CPU but it is recommended to use a, use a GPU. So if you use the latest models, for example, the, the new Llama 3, um, with a GPU, it's quite snappy. It's like the responses are instant, I would say, very similar to ChatGPT. 
but it would be recommended to have a GPU in the server, yeah, indeed. Yeah. A particularly high-end one? 3090, no. 4090? Mm, don't think it's needed. No. I think we have in our internal server, we have a mid-range one, I, don't for I forgot which one, but it's fine. Don't need to pay, like, don't need to buy the uh, most expensive one. Um, Following around the hardware support, um, particularly with image recognition, yeah. I'd love to see the use of things like the Google to uh, the Google TPU devices. They they just sit sit power, and they can do a lot of really great things. And haven't quite seen it be pulled into any uh, any projects like Nextcloud or Image or anything. So just a, a maybe yeah. to see there, we can get some of that. Uh, yeah. You know, Google to Google TPU kind of. Yeah, so the, the image recognition is actually quite simple. It doesn't require any special resources. So um, we did a test for a big service provider lately where it's like a few billions of images that needed to be processed. And I think with a normal server without a GPU, I think it took like 0 0.2 seconds per image or something. And it also works in the background, right? You can still upload all your photos very quickly and then in the background it goes through it and, and checks for objects and this is actually super fast. Yeah, these tiny little TPUs, they can do hundreds of frames per second. Yeah. Yeah, I'm well, sure you can you can throw more hardware on it. It's not <laughs> always good. But uh, this part is actually super snappy. It's the big LLMs that are more challenging. Yeah. yeah. Besides the GPU requirements, what is the what do you see on the memory requirements for the vector databases? Yeah, I mean, it needs to be big enough to fit all the content, right? I mean, if you have a terabyte of documents, which is not usually a problem, because if you have like so much data, I mean, it can only index like text, right? It can in cannot index videos at the moment. And if you have so much data, you probably have some other binary files or something, and they're not that, yeah, you cannot index them. But I mean, if you really have a ton of data, a ton of emails, then you'll then need to fit into the vector database somehow, yeah. So it can happen that it needs like terabytes of data. It doesn't need to fit into memory, that's not important, but it might need a lot of storage. But it totally depends on how much storage you have there in the first place. And is that vector database all just encapsulated or is that another service you need to yeah. that? So yeah, this was a question earlier. So in the latest version with Assistant 2.0, we decouple this completely. So this is um, uh, communicating via an API that we call the, um, the OCS, the Open Collaboration Services API, which is a REST API, to a different machine. So it can be a different machine running somewhere completely different, um, doesn't need to be on the same hardware. Um, we also did some um, um, partnership agreements with some cloud, cloud providers like um, OVH, I think was uh, mentioned earlier, or EONOS or some others. And you can also outsource the large language model to them if you want. They have products called like LLM as a service, and you can send the data to them and then you don't have the resources on your side. So there are lots of different options. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, on your, so you have that rating scale you made for different APIs and LLMs. Um, do you have a central source where we can look through the different models and APIs that you've rated? Yeah. I've only seen them on like the integration pages so far. Yeah. There should be on the integration page, but also on the App Store. If you go to appstore.nextcloud.com, you should also see them if you go through the AI um, features. Okay, so I can't search it by like, I only want to use green, and then look yeah, what it can classify. Yeah, so I don't think anyone has created this fancy search yet. Okay. So, sorry for that. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, comment and a question. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to say thanks to you and the next cloud team for the work that you've done. Um, I was in the audience way back in 2011 when you first announced the project, and <laughs> it's impressive to see. Um, my question is, um, are you or is anybody else in this space looking at building new freely available like base models? Because you, men you mentioned um, using Meta's uh, yeah. model, for example, right? Like, at the end of the day, that's still being trained by a massive corporation who happens to be giving it to us right now. I'm curious what your plans are for insulating yeah. all of that. Yeah, good question. I forgot to mention that. So 
we as Nextcloud are not in the position to create our own foundation models. That's like, um, yeah, as you mentioned, it's, um, it takes really a lot of data, it takes a lot of resources. The good thing is that lots of them are available and what we're doing, we can build on top of it uh, with fine tuning. That's actually something we are doing where we take like domain specific data and we fine tune some of this, um, these um, foundation models to create like specialized models for different use cases. That's something we can do. We can also um, yeah, connect them via the vector database to additional data. And we can also create our own models for the more smaller use cases like the image recognition, for example. We cannot create uh, the really good foundation models um, yet. This is like cost billions of dollars here. Yeah. Do you know if there's anybody kind of in the wider Linux free software space that's really starting to think about how to tackle that? So if you look at, at hacking phase, um, you see um, lots of different startups from all over the world. And you also see a lot in, the, in, in research. So a lot of like universities and research organizations are also contributing there. Um, but it is, uh, yeah, that part is tricky. Right? Really takes a lot of money. I think Nestral is a good one. What's that? Nestral? Oh, yeah. yeah, that's from a French startup. That's quite good. Yeah. 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 Okay, so my question is, uh, you, you spoke about Langchain and, 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 you know, yeah. building on top of LLM and, and the, with Nextcloud. Is Nextcloud a, a product or is it a platform? The reason I'm asking that question is, Myself and my team, we've developed a, a, an assistant for the construction industry, mm -hmm. but our, our model has a lot of nice secrets in it. Yeah. So we're at the point right now where we need to put it into the cloud to make it available for people. Do we put it in Amazon's cloud or Google's cloud or can we put it into your cloud? Yeah. So you can't put it into our cloud because we don't have a cloud. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Nextcloud is a platform in a way that there are several hundreds of integrations into other software available. And what you're doing, I would love if you would integrate into Nextcloud from a functionality perspective, but then you need to deploy it somewhere, right? Because we don't do any hosting. You still need to put it on some infrastructure. You can put it on your own machines or DigitalOcean or AWS or whatever you choose um, to make it a service but we are building only the software, so we don't have an infrastructure in that way. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, many of the large tech companies that we'd all recognize are lobbying for uh, regulations of the use of AI. You mentioned some of the ethical concerns around the use of AI. How do you think about that as implemented in an open source and locally on-prem you know, solution? That's a very good question. So, um, uh, in Europe, we um, we have the AI Act now, which I think is the worldwide first regulation of um, AI systems. And um, I was a little bit involved there with discussion with politicians there. And I think it's good that we have regulation because of all the risks that are associated to it. But you also have to be careful because Sometimes you see these big tech companies being really in favor of regulations. And um, the strategy they have often is to make it so complicated so that smaller organizations cannot compete anymore. Right? You, for example, in, in, in Europe, there was a discussion if every LLM that is used needs to be like certified and tested and put into, I don't know, into some regulation framework. This, of course, would mean that if you're just a student in the university you're playing around with something, you cannot do it. Right? You can only do it if you're a big company. So this is like, with regulation, you have to be a bit careful, right? I mean, I'm all for regulating the big ones, but you need to do it in a way that like, the open source community doesn't suffer. So that would be my take on regulations. Yeah. Line. <laughs> okay. uh, I was wondering, uh, what are the main revenue sources for Nextcloud? Yeah. 
Good question. <laughs> so um, with Nextcloud, we chose to um, release everything we do as free software as open source, mostly HGPL on the server and GPL for the for the clients on desktop and mobile. Um, we as a company, we have um, we sell support enterprise support contracts to bigger organizations. So it's very similar to what Red Hat and SUSE and Canonical and MariaDB and many others are doing. So it basically means that if you go to the website, you can download the zip file with all the stuff. And if you know what you're doing, you can install it and it's fine. But if you're like a big organization and we have um, some customers who have millions of users on Nextcloud, you might work together with us to get information how to scale it and how to make it secure and how to extend it and so on. And this is what we sell as enterprise subscriptions. And this is how we make our, our money. Yeah. I'm also happy to report that um, we don't have any external investors at Nextcloud. So we completely bootstrapped, um, which means that our business model is working. So the support contracts bring, they bring enough money that we can sustain the team and are actually growing. So quite happy about this business model. Yeah. Any other questions? Brent. Uh, what's coming next? <laughs> 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 so next load is, in a, is a community project. Everything we do is on GitHub. We actually have a few thousand contributors and I think what's coming next is what the community is doing. Um, <laughs> we as a company also have some ideas, of course. Um, but um, yeah, let's see how it goes the next few months. But at the end, it's a community project. Everybody can influence it. You can open feature requests and bugs and pull requests and everything on GitHub and yeah, decide what's coming. Okay. I think we are running out of time now, so thanks a lot. Thank you.